when you stick a camera in front of a graffiti artist, you will maybe try and establish a conflict between what politicians and media say about this art and what the actual artist thinks it is, which maybe makes an interesting film, maybe makes an interesting debate for media. It's not an interesting debate for art and artists, it's just, it's just not. New art. This is third year running. The lovely Martin Reed invited us over. Come and paint some stuff. Put some stuff in the street. Stavanger is a city, you know, a population of 120,000, little quaint wooden houses. It can get very mundane and kind of culturally quite sterile. Until you do bring foreign guests over. I almost don't want to write on anything because I feel like it's going to ruin the mood of the town. It's so strange for a city of this size to be able to bring so many artists. It's not the center of the art world. Come nel cinema ci sta il Festival di Venezia o il Festival di Cannes, Stavanger. Cioè il festival più importante della street art adesso. I turned down going to Tokyo. I really wanted to go. But I didn't want to turn down going to Stavanger because what more mellow up location than Stavanger to like get over your administrative detention in China hangover, you know what I mean? I think new art has given me that second stepping stone from from having a full pattern to kind of now saying, you know what, just go for it. I mean the ideal was to form this core group of people who gel this little family so that we weren't constantly out there trying to make friends with street artists we didn't know, which is a bit cheesy. No, I don't think Stavanger realises what the bloody hell's going on, eh? Do you know what I mean? And they get it in the papers, they get told all the facts, but it's a, it's a kind of weird scene. Well, you've got dealers, you've got dealers in London buying walls. Somebody puts a piece up and then the dealer comes in and buys the wall. I don't think the people here really know the true worth or kind of recognition that they hold across the globe. The fact that they come here and they choose Stavanga and choose to get involved with us reprobates astounds me every time. The first time I saw graffiti art was in New York City in 1971. Didn't understand why people was, were doing this in New York. But I realized if I left something in the street, I knew that uh, the people will recognize it and uh, will ask who is doing that in the street. At that time, it was more to get famous, I wanted, I wanted to be a pop star. When you have something new to say, it takes a long time to get admitted. Long, long, long time. It takes an entire life. You know, it can take a long. It took my life. You know, it took uh, 30 years. I kind of got into to putting art in the street because I realized that I could get it out there and have many more people see it, and it could somehow create some sort of that like, communication. You know, people use the streets to go to work, to get back from school, back from like fighting with their girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever, you know? And then you can tap into that and then it becomes relevant to them. I won't just put any image any old place. You know, I try to put, in, put the images in places that the people can relate to them. Choose a wall, think about what would look really good on it. Try and interact with the, the city a bit, you know? What's going on? I think it's unspoken that the artist always looks at the location because of its situation. It jumps from a graphic to being a work of art. It may not be everybody's taste. You may piss off some people, but it's not like you're doing a burning cross upside down or anything, is it? I started to make graffitis in, uh, in Paris in 1981. The first graffiti was very uh, primitive. I used to make a small rat, you know, running along the uh, the sidewalk, because in red you have art, the same letters and art.
I didn't want to make uh, graffiti like I saw in New York because uh, I thought that in Paris it, it, the environment was completely different than in New York. I made a trip in, uh, in Italy with my parents and I remember to have seen uh, some images of, uh, uh, of Mussolini with stencil. So both things mix it, you know, uh, combine it. The thing I saw in New York, the thing I saw in Padova when I was a kid, both things mix it and combine. I, uh, I decided to make graffiti with stencil. I started out on the streets. Um, I moved into to doing clubs and artwork in clubs with the graffiti. I started making sculptures and, and paintings that are being sold in galleries. But now I want to take it back out again, back out in the sculpture form. I always saw myself as an artist. So when people were saying that what I was doing was vandalism, I wanted to combine the two and bring both sides together. So it was mixing the two that saying, look, I am an artist. Um, I might use the streets as a place to paint, but it doesn't mean I don't still use the same techniques and skills as any other artist or painter who uses acrylics, oils, or the, you know, pencil. It's 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 just another another tool in your your kind of kit. I like the idea of putting graffiti in different places. And for me to kind of put a big 3D graffiti piece in a place that you wouldn't normally have it, you're not now stuck to just the wall space, you can actually just put it in the middle of a street. I just thought, I've got to make it. It's got to be something that I can actually at least, you know, move around. Now you can imagine these pieces being built into architect, you know, becoming furniture or becoming 3D objects or becoming whole buildings. It's an urban form as valid as architecture. My work's been a melting pot of things that I've been inspired by growing up. So there's obviously graffiti, there's skateboarding, there's comic books, there's pop art. And I guess pop art was the first time that I saw art that combined all these things, but put it in a fine art context. When I saw Warhol and Lichtenstein. I'm not quite sure how they've managed to make this art, but I kind of understand it as art. I think people are advertising savvy, they know how to break down the images and the communication. And what I try and do is subvert that. My work's always been about subverting common imagery that you understand. As Lichtenstein said, his, his imagery is always about someone else's art. Never imagined I could wake up every morning and like what I did and manage to survive doing what I like to do. He's a really good example of someone who can go into popular culture and take influence out and merge them. And I think if you put his whole body of work together, you know, you get this massive collage of influences from everywhere. Well, for the last 20, 30 years, since postmodernism was first propounded in universities about breaking boundaries between high art and fine art, coincided with a cultural shift in the UK, probably through a reaction against Thatcherism, which the flip side of that coin made a lot of creative people self-sufficient. When you're a kid, you're fearless. You, 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 don't, you don't stop. Consequences aren't a problem. You're, right, let's go. Let's do it. Oh, no. So-and-so saw curtain fiddler, calls the police. Bang, it's all over. Do you know what I mean? It's just like, you know, whoop. And then you're, you're, that's it, it's all over, isn't it? You're, you're in a police cell for the rest of the night. And then you've got like, you know, court appearances for the next three months or something, you know? When you get a bit older and you get more, you've got more responsibilities on your shoulders, you, you're not so prolific. You have to get wiser about how you're going to actually sort of achieve um, getting a street piece up there. The most important thing is being able to kind of wake up each morning and see your kids. You know, you don't want to be like locked up in some like gnarly police cell, you know what I mean? It's just, that's not clever. Um, the way to do it 
is, is to kind of just to kind of take your time a little bit, try and interact with the, the city a bit, you know, and then find means and ways of being able to kind of execute the painting without being seen. We didn't want to say, well, this isn't about tagging, this is about fine art now. I think someone like Word to Mother is so prolific. You know, everyone's walking around with you know, his tag on their shoe or their bag or their ears, like running around like a maniac. And it does remind everyone that this art form all started with a tag. is a great example of someone that a politician can shine a spotlight on as a vandal tagging hoodlum. But that's not word to mother, that's one aspect of the culture that is involved in. I've had enough of the sort of generic character on the wall thing, I don't think I'm really saying anything or pushing anything in particular, so here I just wanted to be completely loose and Dee was doing a, a big letter piece as well and it was just nice to switch it up and relax for a bit and, and it turned out nice, it's simple, like you don't have to oversource stuff which I think I do a lot of the time when it comes to a wall. A lot of the other people don't run around tagging anymore. Um, the fact that he does is, yeah, is cool. Or it's not cool, it's just important and relevant. Um, and I think that's a word that doesn't really exist enough in any art form, really, whether it's relevant or not. I did graffiti for a number of years, you know, sometimes a lot of it, sometimes not that much of it. You know, I, I wanted to leave a mark, leave a stain. It wasn't until 98 that I started cutting stencils. I started working with the kind of images that I grew up around, which are the kind of images that you see in my paintings of working class and inner city atmosphere. Basically, I'm looking for something that means something to me, that either reminds me of a place I've been or people that I know or people that I grew up around or a certain kind of mood that I'm familiar with. First, it has to speak to me and then I put it out there to see if it'll speak to other people or not. You can see here in the background, um, they're doing one of our projects, Laser Tag. Um, and Laser Tag is basically just a free speech tool that allows people to kind of amplify their voices in public space. We've specifically targeted graffiti writers as a group of people we want to make things for, just because we're fans of graffiti. But um, it also works for you know, protesters and pranksters. I think if anything's going to be recognized in this period of time, then GRL and what they're doing is making history. And because they are working with new technologies, that it's always going to be of its day. They're always going to be relevant to not just this scene, but to society as a, as a whole. But you give people a laser pen and they're still going to draw a giant cock. I never thought, really, I'd get arrested. I thought we'd get deported, for sure. I was traveling all over the world, kind of bouncing around and just looking at graffiti everywhere, but I knew I had kind of signed up to help this group called Students for a Free Tibet do some political protest in Beijing. I went to Beijing, I built the tool, I tested it, um, realized I was being told, met up with my friends and we were like, I'm being told, this, you gotta, you know, the laser works, someone else is gonna have to do it because they're gonna pick me up. And then uh, before we could even leave the bar, they started picking us up one by one as we left. And then I've spent the last next six days um, in administrative detention in China. They take me out of the cell at least once per day and usually all night long just to interrogate me. Of course, we had nothing to say because they busted the operation like in the first 26 hour interrogation session. So the rest was just like rubbing it in. I was told I was going to murder China and that uh, um, while I didn't actually plan to wield the knife, I made the knife and that I should show them the hand. 
You know, this was literally the way they said it. You're, you're a clever man, Jemasa, <laughs> but you're lying to us. It's dangerous for us to be in the building any longer because there we have cans right at hand and we could just go on forever. A haircut society is true artists, not people in universities studying fine art. It's just someone with a sketchbook drawing all the time. I like to say I, he does the, the fine art part and I do all the trashy parts and do all the messy stuff, the drips and everything that's more fun to me. <laughs> But um, it's, it's a good contrast, and we like that contrast. Very early I um, tried to uh, find a good way to make my illustration character in a, illustra uh, in a realistic way, give them life. But uh, if I, then I start with realistic, and I do uh, only realistic. We like to see it um, as a conversation that we have, and he puts his, you know, it's his input and mine, and we're basically drawing or painting um, our thoughts. But the good thing is that we are do uh, illustration in a totally different way. That's uh, very different dynamic levels, and I think that's the interesting point. That's the reason why it makes uh, tension. It has a lot of tension. tension, but I felt like this is a very honest um, piece. For all of a sudden, the wall wasn't so big anymore. We claimed it, we really made it our home or the home of our little rats and creatures. I don't really believe that art exists until anybody else sees it. You know, if it's just static and stays in your room, it kind of it kind of haunts you, you know, and when it becomes really dynamic, then it starts to develop and suddenly this whole other like, collective is involved, you know, the, the public. Like when I started, I thought that I thought of it myself, kind of. And then I kind of remembered seeing all these things when I was traveling and, oh, that's how it got there. I just started working with cardboard because I like the aesthetics of it. It's a very immediate, material, it's uh, accessible, it's always there, and it's trash. You know, I deal a lot with the ideas of things being temporary, I think that's one of my motivations. I kind of see my work as sometimes like borderline kitsch. I just want to try to find that, that most basic and simplistic like human thing, you know, because art is for artists, politics are for activists, you know, and, and it's, it's kind of like you're all in the same shit together, you know. Molto spesso non ha una, una valenza eh, di, di, di attualità o di conflitto rispetto a, agli accadimenti del mondo, ma eh, è più un modo di, di espressione eh, meno forzato, forse, forse più autentico, non lo so. Sì, diciamo che eh, inizialmente la, la nostra ossessione è stata comunque sempre la tecnica, fin dall'inizio, lo, lo stencil è una tecnica di stampa. Gente comune che poi in un contesto urbano e metropolitano come quello di Roma diventano quasi delle presenze che fanno parte di, di tutto, un, tutto un contesto anche urbano, no? come se fossero dei personaggi che la gente non conosce, che che alla fine creano curiosità in chi li vede. Diciamo che qui in, questo, in, questo, in questa occasione abbiamo deciso di, di, di riprodurre in grande scala una un'incisione di Doré che riguarda uh, un'incisione de della Divina Commedia che 
riguarda appunto una scena de dell'inferno una scena in cui le anime dei dannati praticamente salgono sulla barca di Caronte eh, per arrivare eh, all'inferno fondamentalmente. Well, I think Leon's belief on the C6, the original art group that he was working on, was that there was no such thing as a subculture. There was only subversion, i.e. you couldn't invent a culture, you just had to subvert cultures that already existed. Lots of stencils that I've done have always been to promote or invade a territory localised to that particular, those particular shows. Well, I keep coming back to new art because I can't, don't seem to be able to get out of it. <laughs> but um, I enjoy the show as well. Uh. I mean, it's, it's nice to actually work on something consistently over a period of years and build something. So that's quite nice. And I can see every year we do it, the execution gets better and the organisation gets better. Actually, you know, I mean, this time, so many people, would, you know, came with such grand ideas and actually realised grand ideas. To have this freedom, all the freedom we have, you know, the way we can work, um, all the space that we have, that does a lot for the artists. From the point of not being a selling show, it's a fantastic opportunity to do something that really is in your heart to do, rather than do something that might have element of, oh, must sell this, you know. It's all, from what I've seen, it's all about pushing yourself. No, it's nice to come out and do something that's, A, new and sort of different from where I've been before, and just trying to keep it interesting for me. It's a kick up the arse to produce something which is hopefully going to raise the bar. I always look forward to new art because um, it's the only festival where, as an artist, you might get punched by the curator, you know? <laughs> it's, um, it really illustrates the difference between like doing something in the art world and doing something in the, the street art world. with new art, unlike a museum or commercial gallery show, for example, is that we're not concerned with the price of street art. Our only interest is with its value. New art leaves behind a body of work that the population can engage with every day of the year, which is absolutely unique for a city of this size.